Things are certainly cooking around the world, are getting a lot more interesting for those that are traders, those that are investors, um, I guess as they say in Japan, taihan desene, means uh, I guess hide your head and run or something, but <clears throat> the, um, the global debt crisis that we've been talking about for quite some time is continuing to expand uh, quite rapidly. Uh, unfortunately, the media and the politicians call it a currency crisis. They haven't quite figured this one out yet, but <clears throat> largely what we're really involved in is a serious debt crisis where capital has been retreating from these various emerging markets. Uh, you can look at, for example, Southeast Asia, the highs really peaked in all the stock markets in 1994, and they were uh, actually in a bear market for three years before the currency was actually noticed in late 97. A currency gives way and at the end of a cycle, not at the beginning. And so, unfortunately, everyone calls them a currency crisis, when in fact, uh, when the currency finally gives way, that's the, the door, the last door slamming as capital is leaving. We're beginning to see that really develop all over the place, um, in Latin America, uh, Russia, of course, um, and uh, we're also seeing what we have to go through yet is still some very serious problems in Japan uh, and also in China. So there are a few more things out there, uh, minefields that we have to be careful about, uh, which will have impacts upon a lot of various things, particularly the capital flows and also the ultimate fate of the Canadian dollar. But all these things are really linked in that, um, particularly in the commodity cycle. Uh, for example, a lot of people keep wondering why you know, gold hasn't rallied or, or things of, of this nature. Uh, the impact is really quite different uh, from the third world. When these currencies collapse, uh, a lot of the third world nations are commodity producers. So their cost of production drops substantially, which means they can then start putting out more commodities. Um, and that's largely the only thing they have to really get hard currency. You've also seen, um, for example, when silver got up to 750 last year, actually 738, um, people were getting quite bullish in, in North America, but at the same time, we found China selling 50 million ounces the government of Uzbekistan selling 25 million ounces. Um, and people wonder, why are they selling at $7? Well, when you take currencies down 40%, and then you take uh, silver up from 450 to $7, all of a sudden, to them, it's kind of like 15 bucks. So you start beginning to see all sorts of commodity stockpiles coming out. We have a lot of problems still in, in the commodity sector. Um, and we've yet to see, uh, I would say, some selling to come out of the Middle East, which is probably going to be next. Um, most of the Middle East na nations are in serious deficits. We tend to think of the Arabs as being quite rich, uh, like the Japanese. But in both cases, there's a lot of uh, economic turmoil in both regions. Uh, there is not really one Gulf state that is in good economic condition at this present time and their budgets are going completely into deficits and they're under a lot of pressure. Uh, and I seriously doubt that you'll see any OPEC uh, agreements maintained still. And you'll probably see additional selling of other stockpiles of commodities coming out of those regions. But Japan remains uh, one of the interesting um, things that we have to really look at and pay very, very close attention to. Uh, Japan is the second largest economy in the world, but it also represents 40% of total world cash savings. So it's, it's a pretty important country to, um, out there for the whole global economy. And what's happening in Japan is, I would say, the closest thing to a 1929 Great Depression that I've ever seen. Um, I just spent the last five weeks in Japan. I've got to go back again next week. I'm back again in March. I mean, they're, they're driving us crazy over there, quite frankly. But um, 
the turmoil in, in Japan is just, it's, it, it's criminal. I mean, I think what the politicians have been doing and not doing. Um, the, the prospects in Japan are, uh, there's pluses and there's minuses. Uh, last year I warned about um, Big Bang Phase 2, which came out the uh, December 1st last year. Um, that basically was a deregulation of the trust funds. There's approximately uh, 9 trillion US dollar equivalent in that category over there, available for investment. Surprisingly, uh, just within the first uh, two months, Goldman Sachs, for example, has raised $6 billion. Uh, to put that in perspective, George Soros has only 10. So that's a pretty good fundraising in the first two months. Fidelity has opened up, running full page ads. Uh, if you want Fidelity products, just go to any bank. They've set up a very good distribution network. Uh, so there's a lot of money starting to pour into um, this fund management side. And what's interesting about it is that the fund management is actually being done in New York. Um, it is widely um, perceived in Japan that if you're Japanese, you don't have the qualifications to manage money. Um, just about every uh, Japanese portfolio manager has lost money. Um, and so if you're a foreigner at this point in time in Japan, it's, it's really you're the flavor of the month. So we're finding a, a, the uh, capital raisings in the fund management side to be quite good. This is having an impact by helping to suppress the, some of the capital repatriation that's going on from the banking sector. So as the people are basically sending their money out, the banks are basically taking it back. So the two are starting to net each other off, and it looks as though the, um, the sheer numbers from the investment side are going to overwhelm the repatriation coming back from the banking side. Most of that seems to be fairly well completed. And I would say you've got a few more weeks left into March 31st. Uh, after that, um, I would start to expect the, um, the yen to start depreciating quite significantly. But in Japan, there's um, a growing time bomb. And the question that really I think we're going to have to, to look at seriously is when does that bomb go off? Um, our computer models will go over tomorrow. Um, effectively, they give us two windows in time where that is possible. One is this year, and the second is 2001. Now, 2001 is phase three of Big Bang. And phase three is where all corporates um, and banks and everyone has to use mark to the market accounting. So that means all the cross holdings, all the shenanigans that have been going on in Japan uh, basically have to come out. And so I think <clears throat> you'll see a, a tremendous amount of selling uh, of portfolios of shares and things of that nature in Japan. Most of the corporate shares, on average, about 40% of their outstanding shares are held by the banks. The banks, in turn, <clears throat> their shares are held by the corporates. And when you sit down with these guys, they say, well, I'll sell if he sells. Um, <clears throat> whoever's going to jump first, you're going to see basically a, a herd of cattle running out of the, out of the pen at that point. Um, and they're, they're really sitting there. The corporates are afraid to be the first one to sell because they're afraid that the banks would then retaliate and start selling all the corporate shares down. So it's, it's an interesting Mexican standoff in that um, area. But Again, the accounting principles come in by 2001. So they're either going to have to show substantial losses, and if you're going to show the loss, you might as well liquidate and take the cash that you have and reinvest it. The other aspect of Big Bang Phase 3 is the change in the insurance to the deposits <clears throat> in Japan. Many people have read about the banking crisis in Japan and that the bad loans represent 40% of GDP. Now, to put that in perspective, even Brazil, uh, Southeast Asia, none of their um, 
debt to GDP ratios ever exceeded 10%. So Japan's about 400 times worse than any of those other areas. What <clears throat> we're going to see in that, um, in that community is that currently the confidence, despite credit ratings being reduced in all the banks one after another, the confidence within the banking sector among the Japan, Japanese citizens remains extremely high. The reason for that is the government has come out and pledged that it will honor all deposits. Now, no one's asking, well, gee, can you, you know, write, underwrite basically 40 trillion yen, um, the entire money supply of the country? I mean, obviously no. But uh, they haven't asked that serious question yet. So phase three, however, brings in <clears throat> uh, the reform to the insurance on deposits, which means that they're adopting standards closer to the US, meaning that the maximum amount of money insured by the government in a, an account on deposit at a bank will be $100,000. Now that's gonna have a very, very significant impact. Um, I meet with some of the largest corporations in Japan, and what's interesting there is that some of the very big household names have more than $15 billion in cash sitting on deposit in the banks, collecting 0.1% on demand. They're not even in government bonds. When I look at them and say, gee, what are you guys smoking over here? Um, Basically, the response is, well, the government will, is guaranteeing we can't lose any money, and we have faith in the Japanese banking system, and we're trying to support it. So the government is using uh, even the corporate share, um, the corporate cash share of the economy to underpin the banking system. The Japanese government has been pulling just about every trick in the book. Um, Recently, uh, those that follow the, the Japanese market closely, the government bonds have, have moved into a short-term freefall um, with interest rates uh, doubling in the, in the course of a couple of months. Now, that's on the 10-year level. What's happened there is that uh, the government came out and said they were no longer going to um, continue to support their own bond market and the bonds natu naturally collapsed. But there's something they didn't quite fully explain in that public announcement. The reason why they're not supporting the bonds is that the largest public fund in the world, which is the Japanese Postal Savings System, which has fluctuated between um, eight to 12 trillion US dollars, depending upon the exchange rate, um, it's close to you know, almost double the U.S. national debt in cash. The bad news is that fund is now insolvent. The government has been using that to support the JGB market. They have been uh, using it in their PKO operations, which, is, which they dub the price-keeping operations to support the Nikkei. All the interventions against the yen. All these things have contributed to the point that um, what's known as Campo in the financial um, trading sectors is basically insolvent. This is now just starting to uh, be discussed publicly in Japan. And I think when the general newspapers really start putting it on the headlines, um, we could begin to have some serious problems there. Um, <clears throat> it all comes down to the fact that the government um, is extremely socialistic. And the politicians have, on one hand, said no public money will be used to bail out the banking system. It's a bailout of the rich. Well, they failed to take into consideration that um, by failing to do that, you put the entire economy at risk, and the average person who might not be rich happens to keep his money in the bank. So by saying they're not going to bail out the banks, but will guarantee all deposits for the individual, um, they think that they can just muddle their way through. Then the problem is that the banks 
basically are caught between a rock and a hard place with 40% of GDP in unperforming loans. They basically just sit there. So you've got 40% of the economy frozen, solid. Um, no hope of getting those assets even moving. A couple of the banks up in, for example, in Hokkaido, which did go down and the government took over, even the bad loans there have not been sold off. The assets still remain frozen. Um, a couple of the big bankruptcies, uh, one, um, Toshoku, uh, which was dubbed as, as one of the, the second largest bankruptcy in Japan since World War II. Nothing's been liquidated. Um, so although these things per, go in, insolvent, they also go dormant. Um, Japan has a unique way of trying to hide um, from these particular problems. Uh, I do not really see where the government's going to be able to be successful at this. Uh, the final uh, straw, I think, has begun to, to break with the fact that they were forced to stop using the postal savings system to, um, to intervene in the marketplace. I find it ironic that the politicians are vehemently against bailing out the rich, but they don't seem to mind taking the deposits of, of all the housewives in Japan and using that as, as their own money. They don't seem to connect the two. So what we are looking at there is some very interesting dilemmas over the next two-year period. Uh, the fact that the Postal Savings Fund is insolvent, you're beginning to see a little bit of this in, um, in this small circulation of the insider uh, press for the financial community. It is yet to make like the front pages of the New York Times or uh, at that level yet. But sooner or later it will. And then we're going to have to see how that confidence in Japan, if it continues to hold in the banking system or not. The <clears throat> other aspect that we have to consider is that uh, Japan remains a huge reservoir of capital. And um, there was a, a leak uh, with, when I was there over the past five weeks um, of an internal letter from Larry Summers, the Under Secretary of the Treasury um, of the United States, to Miyazawa. And the letter said, by our calculations, you guys better put in approximately 25 trillion yen, not six, uh, or we're going to have a serious problem. That made the press over there. Um, so. We are at a, at a crossroads here where something can finally begin to give way in Japan. Now, what are the implications of it? Um, the biggest impact from Japan versus something like Russia or, or um, China or Brazil is that it, it does represent 40% of total global savings. And so that is a huge reservoir of capital that <clears throat> Um, is becoming increasingly more interested in leaving the country. So there is a risk that, depending upon the timing of events, that we could end up pushing, for example, the U.S. stock market through the roof um, still. Uh, right now, we would like to see if the January high holds and a little consolidation I and give it some breathing room would be much better. But our models do show if the Dow were to get through to 9750 level and continue to make new highs after April, we could be in the, um, the last uh, formation of a major, major bubble top. Now, bubble tops are uh, unique in the sense that they run up quite rapidly towards the end uh, and often make advances uh, even 20, 30, and 40 percent in short time periods. Uh, those types of movements are, are things to be very, very concerned about because what comes afterwards is usually pretty bad as well. Um, in the case of, of <clears throat> bubble tops, if we look at Japan in 1989, um, I think this helps to explain what we're concerned about for the United States, and that is that after the 1987 crash, the Japanese lost a lot of money on the bond markets. They lost a lot of money on real estate, and they started taking all their capital home. Well, when they did, 
they had no place to put it. So they started buying stocks in Japanese real estate. So what happened was you ended up with a tremendous amount of capital leaving from around the world economy and concentrating in Japan. So the Japanese share market went up uh, by 40% above its 1987 high. Now even though uh, our markets, uh, including Europe, exceeded their 87 highs, they didn't really make what you would call bubble tops in 89. They exceeded them very marginally. In the case of Japan, it was clearly a bubble top by uh, exceeding it by 40%. And they've been paying the price ever since. There is that risk that if we end up with a surge in capital coming out of Japan, that we could get that type of a move. Uh, right now, it's too early just to tell at the present time. And hopefully, we don't get that. But uh, cheering on new highs much beyond what we've seen could be very dangerous to everyone's financial health. Uh, because what goes up very fast all comes, also comes down very fast. The other side of uh, the world, um, now currently known as Euroland, um, is also creating um, a bit of a stir in the world economy as well. The, um, the politicians there are, have yet to understand that socialism is a dying event. Uh, it's bad for the long-term economic health of any economy. And socialism tends to um, usually end up with a lot of political promises without means for paying for it. But they like to make promises. Um, and so that's usually the earmark of, of socialism. In the case of Europe, um, instead of Europe looking at um, what has happened to create high economic growth in, in North America and as well as in UK, and in Australia for that matter, um, particularly Germany, who's leading the charge, is taking the opposite position. We're seeing a, a tax war beginning to develop in, in Europe that's has the, um, all the signs of sending capital out of Europe quite sharply. The first stages um, began to appear in December uh, when Germany began boasting that they were taking the chair, the chairmanship of the European community, the EC. The EC includes Scandinavia and Britain. The new community, um, the European Monetary Union is 11 states and excludes places like Switzerland, Britain, and um, Denmark, and so on. But Germany still uh, this year <clears throat> is up for the chairmanship of the EC. Germany made it known that they intended to uh, change the rules of the EC and make it majority vote. The purpose of that was so that largely they could ram down the throat of UK, Scandinavia, and the rest of it, anything it chose re relative to tax policy. Germany has been putting pressure on Britain to shut down the Channel Islands as well as the Cayman Islands. The rhetoric coming out of the new Euroland is that Great Britain and other nations that have lower tax rates are engaging in unfair competition. So instead of saying, well, gee, maybe you know, our tax rates might be too high, uh, maybe our regulation is too excessive, and this might be why Europe has had the lowest growth rate of any industrialized area in the world since, since World War II. The last 30 years alone, the economic growth rate of Europe has been at best 2.5%, half of that of North America. This is why unemployment in Europe it, on a good day is still twice what we see here in North America on a bad day. The labor rules in Europe are uh, draconian, to say the least. Um, they're a socialist's dream and a, a capitalist's nightmare. For example, um, most of the money center banks of Europe you would think if Euroland was so great, um, they would be expanding in Europe. 
And what you actually find is that they're moving their money centers, particularly in where it engages uh, foreign exchange and proprietary trading to New York City. The reason is, I spoke to one of the big German banks, and I said, why did you, you move all your proprietary trading to New York? And he said, very simple. He says, if I have one of these traders in Germany, he's a member of the union. If he loses a billion dollars like Nick Leeson, I can't even fire. You have to go through labor arbitration, you can't fire him, and you have to put him into work someplace else. So what you find is, is that um, there are a lot of things that are, do not necessarily meet the, uh, the test of, of great uh, prospects for Europe. The concept of a single currency is also greatly misunderstood. Um, it is really nothing more than, a, um, I think, a, a cloak to hide the real trend in Europe, and that is largely the federalization of Europe. That is what the politicians really want to create. Now, there are some issues there that I think are important to understand because there's a lot of confusing rhetoric going around. Um, we've heard how the euro is going to displace the dollar as the reserve currency of the world. The euro doesn't physically exist. The euro only exists in the memory chips of computers in, in Europe. There is no coin. There is no currency. That will not even be released until 2002. Now, one has to really question why. And over the years, I've spoken to many governments. And if you ask them, uh, what is the ideal monetary system that you would like to see? Including the United States, um, during the Reagan administration, they said, gee, if I could have a wish list, it would be to eliminate currency and go to electronic forms of, of currency. The reason why is that you eliminate the underground economy. Everybody then has to pay a tax on everything. There's no more finding a dime in a parking lot. <laughs> so <clears throat> what's interesting about the euro is that there has been plenty of time to print currency and plenty of time to, um, to mint coins. They've had four years to do so. There's been no effort whatsoever in that direction. Uh, very, very reliable sources um, in a number of different areas. Governments are watching the euro. Because what's happening is, is that the politicians think that they'll get everybody used to these euros, and the only way you can spend them is on a credit card or by check. And if everybody gets accustomed to that, they'll say, well, gee, we don't really need notes and coins after all, do we? There are a lot of governments around the world that are watching this euro experiment. Now, why are they, is Europe trying to do it? Largely because depending upon the numbers, whoever you believe, the underground economy, for example, in Italy is anywhere between 20 and 40 percent. Um, a, an Italian friend of mine uh, told me a joke about it. He said, uh, he said, ask an Italian what a 740 is. He says, the answer in Milan is basically that that's the tax form uh, that the government has. In Rome, it's a, they say, oh, 740, it's a Volvo. And you go down to Naples, you say, what's a 740? It's 20 to 8. <laughs> and that's basically the three economies in Italy. Um, I've loved Italy a lot spent a lot of time there. And I've noticed over the years that during the deepest recessions in Europe, you'll see stores closed in Britain, Germany, France. You go to Italy, everybody says, oh, it's a horrible recession. You never see any stores closed. The Italians, I think, have the ultimate solution to government. And that is, you have about 200 political parties. They all argue amongst each other, and they can't do anything, and you just ignore them. <laughs> So that's why the, the economy in Rome is just a vibrant place. It doesn't seem to be impacted to a large degree by the economic swings of, of the politicians. Everybody just you know, sticks their finger up and says goodbye. You know? <laughs> um, the only way to get at that is to eliminate this cash. And that's what is the real hidden agenda behind the euro. And they are watching it in the US. 
They're watching it in every government sector is paying attention to see if they are successful. There's another place attempting the same thing, and that is Singapore. Singapore <clears throat> is attempting to create a cashless society as well. Um, you have a little uh, experimental project going on down there where there's a, an external gadget that goes on your computer. It looks like a, a three and a half inch floppy disk, when in fact it's, you stick in your debit card. You then go onto the internet, log in your password to your bank, and withdraw $50 or $100 or whatever you want right onto your uh, debit card, then you go out and spend it. The idea is that, that you can eliminate the cash with such an a at-home ATM type system. The interesting thing is that the growth of the internet. Um, hopefully the internet may be the actual savior of mankind. Um, Maybe not necessarily from investment in stock prices. I think a lot of people are going to get hurt at the end. But um, if you take that bank and you suddenly stick it down in the Bahamas, what happens with that technology? You can suddenly have an account down there. You can put in your debit card here in Vancouver, download a thousand bucks from the Bahamas, go out and spend it, and you bypass your own tax system and your central bank. So I think. The internet has some very interesting technology for the future. <laughs> and hopefully, it will be a check against these um, insane politicians that want to keep promising the moon, have nothing to pay for it, and then want to blame us because they didn't collect enough taxes to do it. So Europe is, uh, to say the least, uh, not a great place to be investing right now. Um, the <clears throat> interesting thing, we'll look at some uh, charts of the euro, um, and we've recreated them using the fixed rates that they posted at the end of the year. Uh, depending upon your perspective, the euro has already been in a three-year bear market, and um, if you use the old European currency unit data, it's been in a bear market for six years. So um, it's not getting necessarily a great launch at first. Um, the rhetoric coming out of Germany and France is quite aggressive. It has scared literally the, um, the hell out of a lot of the dealers uh, that I know in London because <clears throat> they're saying that they want to impose a 20% withholding tax on anyone dealing in euros. And that they've said to London that London must collect it as well. London is afraid that they're going to drive all the uh, bond markets and everything completely out of the city and everything's going to migrate to New York. The German proposal for this new tax system there is quite significant. If you were to buy a lottery ticket here, hop on a plane, go to Germany for a vacation, and while you were there you found out you just won $10 million, Guess what? Because you were in Germany at that moment in time, you owe them 20% tax. Anybody traveling through, anybody buying a euro, will be subject to a 20% tax. They're trying to stop the offshore tax-free havens. And in my opinion, I think they're only going to increase the amount of capital that's going to leave. Already, I've seen a tremendous amount of, of capital begin to pour out of, of both Germany and France, moving over to Switzerland. And just six months ago, uh, when I was in Zurich, a number of people were saying um, how depressed it was in Switzerland. And they were asking me my opinion. They were saying, gee, maybe we should move our headquarters out of here. Switzerland's going to be left behind. Maybe we should get back and, um, and move. And I said, I wouldn't necessarily do that so quickly. Why don't you wait to see what happens? Now they're saying, thank God we didn't move. My God, the amount of business that's pouring in here is great. All you have to say is a 20% withholding tax applied to anything in euros. And it's amazing how capital begins to leave. <laughs> so everyone's afraid <clears throat> of what's coming down um, in Europe. There were great expectations initially. The stock markets rallied aggressively uh, in peaked in uh, July 20th la last year. 
Everyone was expecting Euroland was going to bring in sweeping reforms, great increases in productivity, lowering of taxes, and standardization of rules and regulations. Well, maybe that's what they saw in North America, but the Europeans aren't about to try that road yet. So it's <clears throat> going to be a very, very interesting four-year period ahead for the euro. Um, all the indications at this point is that they are attempting to impose the worst restrictions from that of Germany and France upon the rest of the 11 member states. By wiping out tax incentives that countries are no longer allowed to offer tax incentives to get jobs in, to, to get uh, industry in, um, you're going to really significantly impact the economies of, of Ireland who has gained tremendously because of tax incentives for people to move there. Um, most of the Japanese companies went to Ireland because of that reason. You, you got 10-year tax-free deals, 40% discounts if you came in and created jobs there. Uh, now that's regarded uh, from Germany as unfair tax competition. So they're demanding everything is now standardized. Now, if you standardize it, the objective of Germany and France is obvious. They're the ones that are losing jobs. They're the ones whose companies are leaving and moving to these lower tax regimes. So what they want to do is choke off the rest of Europe to stop their own pain. Um, most of the Mercedes today coming out of Europe are actually made in Spain. Um, Porsches are actually being made in, in Scandinavia, not Germany. So you find a, a lot of uh, jobs have been lost because of these excessive uh, taxation and over-regulation of just about everything under the sun in, in Europe. So um, it's going to be a, a fairly rough ride. I don't see this as this wonderful place that its currency is going to replace the dollar. Uh, the dollar is basically circulating outside the United States in places like Russia and China. I mean, how can it replace the dollar if it doesn't even physically exist? Another issue <clears throat> that uh, we tend to take for granted here in North America um, is that our currencies have never been canceled. Um, currency from the last century is still legal tender here. It is a cultural thing that we've gone through. In Europe, it's the opposite. Europe cancels its currency once every 10 years. So if you have, uh, if you went to France in the mid 80s and you got some nice 10 franc coins and you plan to go back to see Paris again, guess what? They're worthless. Uh, all the French francs you may have saved as a souvenir, they're all worthless. Same thing for Britain, Germany, all the way across the board. They cancel their currency routinely as an act of uh, mercy for the state, you might say. Uh, it's a way to prevent people from hoarding cash. It's another attempt to force people to pay taxes. If you, can't, if, if you don't want to come up and say, hey, look, this is how much cash I have, and they check your tax records and say, gee, where did you get this cash? Your choice is you let it expire, it's completely worthless, or you have to go to the bank and declare whatever tax you didn't pay, plus interest and penalties and so on. So um, that is the European system, and most people aren't quite aware of it. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, the European currencies have never really been a reserve currency, because you can't necessarily hold it for a long period of time. It can't circulate in places like China uh, and Russia and then third world if it routinely is canceled all the time. So despite the political rhetoric, um, there's a lot more that goes into um, making reserve currencies um, than meets the eye. And the U.S. Um, would love to get rid of the dollar as a reserve currency because there's a side effect that ends up coming with it. And when I meet with the guys in Washington, they, um, they were hoping that when the gold standard collapsed, that the dollar would no longer be a reserve currency and that they too could act freely. 
uh, but no chance. The dollar, by default, still ended up as a reserve currency. Now, the impact of that is that you get an Asian crisis. So what happens is, is that you have all these other uh, economies that are pegging their interest rates to yours. If you don't lower your interest rates, you run the risk of creating a wider depression globally. So what's interesting is, is that during the, the crash last year, the Fed lowered its interest rates quite aggressively in a, a responsible manner to what was happening internationally. When it came to Germany and France, they said no way. If they want to be a reserve currency, they also have to look beyond their own borders, which they don't seem to be willing to do. You also have to look at what's happening internationally and say, well, we don't give a damn about Asia. We don't give a damn about Latin America or Russia. We're going to maintain our own monetary policy here as if you're separate. Um, so the risks of a reserve currency are far more uh, significant. And um, in Washington, there's nothing more that they would like to do and get rid of that. And if, if there were some way of getting some sort of an international currency going, there would actually be a lot of people down there in favor of it. That's why they're watching the euro very carefully. There are people out there who believe that the ultimate goal is to create some sort of an electronic currency on a global basis. They, some of them advocate three regional currencies, one for the Americas, one for Asia, and one for Europe. There are a lot of crazy ideas that are being floated around out there. But um, currency is, is only masquerading over the problems that really are at issue, and that is the underlying economic conditions. You cannot borrow money forever and never pay it back. Sooner or later, something gives. One of the reasons why uh, we were warning about Southeast Asia and Russia is because we watch these economies quite carefully. And what happens is that investment tends to get, I would say, um, a little drunk at times. And it would be as if you took and said, OK, fine, we got a trillion dollars to invest. Um, let's put it into cotton. I mean, cotton market is nowhere close to being able to handle anything like that. You go down to Southeast Asia, what happened was all this money being poured into there, it just fueled largely buildings that went up so that they could print you know, T-shirts with wonderful new skylines on them, but nobody was in them. Airports that are more sophisticated than what you see in North, North America, nobody uses them. They built all the infrastructure to make it look as if they were this wonderful, great economy, but there's nothing there. We've poured and allowed too much money to be poured into these areas. And there's no means to, to generate a profit on it. The same thing with Russia. There was $100 billion that went in, $200 billion flowing out. One of the reasons why the US market tends to be the, the deepest um, share market in the world is another little known fact. Um, and that is, if you look at Germany and you look at Japan, both of them have extremely high levels of, of cross-share ownership between companies. So you end up with, um, I'm just going to take a break, one second. you end up with only 17% of the German stock market actually floating freely. So now you take a big institution and says, OK, fine, I want to buy $2 billion worth of stock. Is there anything you can buy in Europe? No. Is there anything you can buy in Japan? No. When you end up with high percentages of these companies being owned in a cross-holding basis, you also reduce the liquidity of the marketplace. In North America, we don't have those systems of cross-share ownership. They're illegal. So it's a significant difference between the share markets here versus those of Europe. You cannot look at Europe purely as an index. 
London is much more like North America. You don't have this cross sharehold uh, ownership. But you take Deutsche Bank, it's being forced to start to uh, liquidate some of its cross holdings. It owns majority stakes in so many of the big industrial corporations in, in Europe Daimler Benz, Mercedes. Mercedes, a fully owned subdivision of Daimler Benz with majority shareholderships being in, in these industrial groups. So all of this is, is um, some very interesting prospects for the future because the cross share hold, holdings, both in Europe and in Japan, are leading to the spiral down in these economies. When a bank owns a huge portfolio of stock, very, very serious implications take place. And this is what was discovered here in North America during the Great Depression, and it's why it has been declared illegal ever since. When the bank owns a tremendous amount of stock and the stock market goes down, it loses on its asset portfolio. Taking those losses, what does it do? It reduces the loans that it, it then has available for the marketplace. The more the stock market goes down, the less they lend. The less they lend, the more the economy goes down, the more the stocks go down. It ends up as a vicious, vicious cycle downward. If you're a small company in Japan right now, you can't borrow one yen. The credit crunch in Japan is very, very severe. And it is all being caused by this cross-share holdings. There is great pressure for them to be unwound. And it is one of the reasons why we still see the Nikkei will go below the 10,000 level. Um, so there's a lot more to look at in some of these markets than purely um, P.E. ratios or prospects for the future. The last subject I'll touch on uh, are the Internet stocks. Um, a lot of people <clears throat> wondering what the hell is going on over there. Um, I'll say this, in, the internet is unquestionably a new innovation. It is equal and as, as important to the world economy as, for example, the invention of the railroads, airplanes, cars, or whatever. I think it is very similar to the railroads in the sense that when the railroads were finally connected from east coast to west coast, they sparked another innovation called mail order. Sears and Roebuck suddenly began to be able to issue catalogs. It didn't have stores across coast to coast, but it could suddenly now have a means to deliver those goods. The internet is doing the same identical thing. But although its long-term growth, I think, is going to be absolutely spectacular, um, there are grave signs to be worried about as well that most of the internet stocks will probably end up going bankrupt. Um, it's kind of like playing chess. The first pawns out often are the first things to go. But another example of that is when electricity became um, the latest hot invention. GE was uh, a really hot stock in the 1920s. When the markets collapsed, GE fell so fast, so hard, and so far, that it was actually considered not worth even listing. And that's General Electric today. So just keep in mind on these internet stocks that what goes up very fast also comes down very fast. There will be um, long-term survivors, but there will be a lot of casualties in there. Um, this is something that is completely normal. We've seen it with every major uh, innovation wave that's come uh, over the last 200 years. Um, it is not the indication of the stock market itself. Um, just because the NASDAQ makes new highs does not necessarily mean that the capital flows are shifting or anything else. A lot of these stocks are just highly speculative. A lot of people are playing them, and it doesn't take a lot of money to drive them up. So. Um, We'll look at those a little bit more in detail um, on the various different indices tomorrow. But I think the main thing that we have to keep in mind is that the global economy is becoming even more closely tied than ever before. 
The capital flows are, are gyrating around faster than ever before, and the impact that we're seeing is crossing borders everywhere. Um, there does remain a risk that if the Canadian dollar does not get back above the 70 cent level uh, fairly soon, that the Canadian dollar could still have one more wave down even as far as the 56 cent level. But that is not necessarily a reflection upon Canada. We have most likely one more wave of currency devaluations coming and that's um, going to hit largely in China uh, and impact on Hong Kong as well. Um, the side effect of the euro is that there is uh, over a hundred billion dollars that has been raised by hedge funds for trading currencies. They just lost all the European markets effectively. Um, so you're not seeing a lot of volume anymore on Deutschmark, French franc, or crosses within Europe. So that capital needs to invest on the currencies or trade the currencies. So with one third of the world economy sliced off, suddenly you have a lot more capital focused on fewer currencies. So the volatility and things like dollar yen go through the roof. 700 point moves, no problem. Brazil suddenly cracks. Uh, we're, going, we're beginning to see capital building on the Hong Kong dollar. An attack there will probably take place by March, April. Uh, China uh, has backed away and allowed some of its private um, or government-owned um, companies to default. That's the first sign that um, blood is starting to pour out of their eyes as well. So a round of currency devaluations in those areas will cause a lot of crazy selling and wild fluctuations to take place in all the currency markets. Uh, it just happens to be the type of cycle that we're in right now. Uh, people are confused. They don't understand why things are moving the way they are. And so they don't necessarily wait. They jump and ask questions later. So the volatility that we've been warning about over the last several years uh, is alive and well. We're still in a huge bull market of volatility that doesn't peak until about the year 2003. So if you think this is bad, it's going to get a lot worse yet. Um, so those that are uh, options traders and know how to play volatility, you've got a good, uh, pretty good bull market ahead. Uh, those that are uh, investors that tend to buy and hold, uh, you better start paying attention because even sitting still, you might lose 20% one month and then make it back another month. Uh, the volatility is pretty high in a lot of these sectors. Um, so tomorrow we'll look a little bit closer at some of these um, uh, factors um, and their impact and the prospects that we see, particularly going in, as well as uh, another one which I didn't have time to get to tonight, which will be um, year 2K problems at the end of the year. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.